I think we are live. I think we are live. We are live. Thursday night live. A little Torah. It's a little Torah. Thursday night live. You're just getting the camera straight. Hi there. Um, so tonight I, I something has all right. Is that better? Can people hear me? I hope we can hear be heard. I think I had to mute my computer. Um, but here we are on uh Thursday Night Live, and tonight's topic is finding our pain points. And so I'm just going to start without um, much explanation, but to introduce this idea that each of us in our lives um, has a soul journey. And if we allow ourselves to be sober with it, we can um, face the trials and the tests that we're meant to confront. And I think if you heard the words trials and test, you might understand that we are in Parshat Ve'era, because this is the Parsha, the Torah portion where Abraham meets his trials and his tests. And so inspired by that idea, I have this, this tonight's theme, which is finding our pain points. And the premise, again, is it's going to have some personal um, insights into the way uh, in my life my pain points have actually revealed my soul journey. And we're going to uh, begin by looking at Avraham and his soul journey and how he uh, had revealed to himself at some point that his self-determination was only going to be um, pushed back with this other force that might be called God. And I think that paradigm between mm -hmm. us singularly and us being in relationship to whatever this guard force is calling us towards, that pain point is 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 something that most people, I think, when they get there, they want to anesthetize themselves. They want to medicate themselves. They want to turn that pain point off. But a part of tonight's premise, it's it's in that pain, in that burn, is actually that's the ish. That's the ish. That's the fire of the snay. That's the fire of the burning bush. We won't be consumed by experiencing our pain point. There's no being consumed by experiencing our pain point. There's only actually an experience with the divine. So Thursday Night Live is uh, coming to you live tonight from Open Temple Soul Journey Studios. Our beautiful studio here is a music studio that we have at Open Temple House. We're live from Venice, California. And uh, part of Open Temple, I don't know if I explained this, I'm, I'm actually um, a chick who loves Torah who went to several seminaries and in the end they gave me a few master's degrees and they someone put their hands on my head and said you're a rabbi whatever that means and at the end of the day i'm just a chick who loves torah and loves everything about jewish spirituality because i didn't grow up with it and when i discovered it my life made so much more sense and so thursday night live is just our 1.0 of being able to share my torah tonight with you so that you can have your torah and if you want to share it with me put it down on your um on the Facebook page and we can exchange our Torah later when I look at those notes. Um, okay, but we have to go to 30, Thursday Night Live, we have to establish a covenant. So I always explain, we have a covenant and we have kavanot. Covenant like a brit for what is a community agreement. Our agreements and our intentions are the following. Number one, this she or this class comes from a place of love. So I'm just completely heart-centered for you tonight. And I hope that um, those receiving these words can come from a place of love as well. Um, we must open our hearts to spiritual transformation and self-transformation because from spiritual transformation, things can happen on the outside as well. So we must open ourselves up to transformation and revelation in our midst. Um, third, I recommend getting a journal or a legal pad because if you want to write something down, and I love using the term legal pad because sometimes when you work on those yellow pages, different part of the brain is spiked out. And sometimes for some people it's a computer, but my point is just to take notes because I don't know about you, but only some things happen when I, when I verbalize it, when I communicate it. And so if we're going to do study, let's do it for real. Um, next, when judgment arises, let it bubble to the surface and then, you know, you can write it down, you can let it go, you can observe it and let it pop like a soap bubble. Um, so just let the judgments come because I believe strongly that judgments are, are sometimes um, the geode on the outside and when you pull it open, there are the jewels. Uh, there are many ways to do Jewish. 
there are many ways to do Jewish. This is the, just the path that I'm offering tonight. And finally, uh, Jewish denominationalism. I consider Jewish denominations a 19th century Jewish innovation. I share this because some people are like, oh, you're a chick. You don't have a beard. Right? You're not a real rabbi. I don't know what a real rabbi is. I just, again, say I'm a chick who loves Torah. Everyone has their Torah. We're here to offer our Torah tonight. And denominationalism is different ways of doing Judaism. I say it's 19th century innovation when Jews were told that they could be citizens of a country first and Jewish second. So I hold that in context so that we can understand whatever denomination we come from, we're really all just Klal Yisrael. And a part of the Soul Journey offering I give tonight with Thursday Night Live is to redeem the idea of Yehud that we all have, this beautiful intimacy of being Klal Yisrael. So I hope that we can do that as well. Uh, if you have a Hamash, get it, crack it open. I always tell people that when you open a homage, the first thing to do is look on the spine and see who the publisher is, because that's going to teach us the agenda of the translation and the way that it was ordered or organized on the page, um, the way white space or extra space outside extra biblical material is, is, is presented. And so know whose agenda is being offered up so that you can hear their voice authentically. And that's one of the critical ways that we can move from dogmatic, a more dogmatic approach to understanding Jewish life and texts to a more intimate, what I sometimes call a postmodern approach, meaning we're coming to Torah from who we are, like the ancients did. You know, they just, they would hear it read and they would hear these stories and through the sound waves of the stories reaching their ears and their hearts, they would be transformed. So I'm hoping we can come back to a little bit of that. Then I, I want us to think, I always say, where are we in the Jewish hero's journey in the year? And Tishrei was last month. It seems oh so long ago. A part of what we enter into after Tishrei is over is this month of Heshvan, which is called Mar Heshvan, Bitter Heshvan. And the rabbis have all sorts of reasons for saying that. And I think ostensibly what I think about is um, it's bitter because we have no holidays. And so we're left to dwell in the realities of who we are without the distraction and the pretensions of the posturing we have in the holidays. So you're kind of, you pop out at the end of Tishrei, having gone through all this spiritual transformation. And then Heshvan is this spaciousness where we have to deal with the bitterness that we haven't really transformed that much and we still have work to do. And that's where the work starts tonight. So let's begin with the blessing for Torah and do the work for reals. It's Baruch, oh, I'm going to take a moment. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Asher kitshanu b'mitzvotav etzivanu la'asok b'divrei Torah. So that is basically get busy with Torah and thank you, uh, Hashem, for giving me Torah. Let's get busy. Um, so where were we? When last we met our hero, it was Lech Lecha and he went on a journey. And it was meeting Avram and him going through his own spiritual transformation and becoming Avraham, meeting his wife Sarai and seeing her spiritual transformation, becoming Sarah. And at the end, at the climax of the portion, um, Avraham circumcises himself and all of his servants in an act of like grand amunah. I mean, this is like absolute faith. Talk about pain points. Ouch! So there's this idea of a brit, milah, right? Like, talk about pain points. Let's just start with that one. A brit milah, right? It's like a full covenant. It's like, it's not Malay, but it has the same bilateral root as Malay. And it's like this complete kind of cut that they do, this cut of the foreskin. Um, and why is it on the male member, right? We don't talk about that. Why in the ancient world did we not choose an earring? Or, you know, perhaps a piercing on the lip. You know, we, we, we Dafka chose this one point that um, in today's world, there are criticisms or chuvot written by people who are progressive Jews saying it's genital mutilation. Um, we know that it's a vestige or appendage skin that we, you know, some scientists say serves a purpose and some say it doesn't. There are actually the data on both sides kind of uh, neuter one another. And so when I ask myself really, like, why there, um, I'm, I'm left with, first of all, when people say, oh, it, you know, what you're doing is mutilation, I'm always and traumatic to the child. I'm always saying, well, what the kid went through eight days before was a lot more traumatic. I mean, birth is very traumatic experience, a little cut, 
not quite the same thing. Um, I'm not I'm not trying to mitigate that a child feels pain, but I want to talk about pain points tonight, and that is a particular pain point. And a part of of what I've come to, and this is just a personal chidush, you know, a part of what I come to, if if we are going to try to apprehend a physical space that Habore, the Creator, dwells in, and if we have this metaphor of Abraham, Avraham Avinu being our first progenitor, what is the image of where creation begins in a human understanding of creation? You know, as, as someone, and I'm, I'm always, I'm very open, as someone who went through IVF, um, they had to take out my egg, but they also had to take out my husband's sperm and put it inside of the egg in order to create the child. And I, I bless my children and say, thank you. Thank you for letting mommy do this for 30 minutes and talk about Torah. So a part of what I'm starting with tonight are pain points and the idea of why would we begin a human storytelling of a specific theology with one God, a God that is the force of creation with such a marking, if not, it's the, if not it being the only marking on the body that could truly embody what our creation story is about. You know, creation is, is, is perhaps the, um, the creation of a human is perhaps the closest that humans come to knowing of a God concept. And so in a time talking about pain points, when we look at Brittany Law and everything that Abraham went through, uh, it started with this. And this was his covenantal moment when he started it. And it started with this like very ponderous, uh, uh, querulous, like unknowable, um, unknowable act. And it then it was something that was so powerful that to this day we engage in this ritual. Like that is profound. And it all is this kind of metaphor of pain point. Those of us who have been to a Brit Mila, sometimes the kid falls asleep and sometimes you do hear a little boy cry. And, and, I want to think instead of saying that it's it's a negative in the child's life, a part of what I'm fascinated by is how there's something about the intimacy of our pain points and our God that helps us understand something greater than ourselves. Habore, the creator. So we meet in this Torah portion, we meet this idea of Abraham Avinu, and he has just given himself a Brit Milah, and um, he is waiting on his tent. He's actually recovering he's he's in convalescence on his tent and he is um he's convalescing and there lo and behold arrive these uh three these uh, the three where are they where are our messengers let me get to it we are on genesis 18 i believe here i'm going to my parsha right over here thank you so much ah it's so gorgeous genesis 18 right Whoa, when the Masorites ordered, you know, the Chomash and organized it, they gave Vayera in chapter high. I'd like to say there's no coincidence here. They knew what they were doing. So let's begin with our Torah. It's Vayera Elav Adonai Ilone Mamre Vuhu Yoshev Petacha Ochel Kachom Hayom. Right? So there's Avraham Avinu. And he is um, chilling at his tent, and he is in the heat of the day. And we know that he just went through this experience where he and all of his fellows were circumcised. And um, he's in a place of sitting in his pain point, right? I can't imagine that this was a comfortable way. And, it, and, it, and it's, it's like he's, he's there. And while he's sitting in his pain point, what happens? It's Vayera Elav Adonai. God appears to him. And that's like, you know, in a time when pain clinics and addictions to opiates because of pain medication are so, um, are, are just so flaring and so prevalent. What does it mean that a dude is like sitting on his pain and kind of waiting out the heat of the day and God appears to him? Like, is there something to that? I think this Parsha is going to reveal it for us. So Yoshev Petach Ohel Kahom Hayom. There he is at the opening. And again, this is the famous moment of all the sides were open because Avraham Avinu just invited everyone in. And this is the famous text of Chakna Sarochim, of welcoming our guests. And what happens that moment? It says, V'yisa e'na ve'yera, right? He looks up and he sees. And this is where I just want to stop. Little biblical, like, stop. 
And uh, taking a look at the word Vayera and Vayar. Vayera and Vayar. Vayar. Okay, those two words. One means appeared right and then we're having a, that he's seeing so we're going to be playing with this word and later on it's going to come in another bilateral route which is um uh, so this is resh olive hay and we're also going to be playing with yud resh olive and i just want to give that a shout out and it, those of us who read hebrew and are kind of moving through this parsha spend some time looking at those two um two uh shorshim those two um, root words, yud, resh, olive, and resh, olive, hey, right? One means to fear or, as Abraham Joshua Heschel teaches us, to convert that fear into awe. And one of them means, um, one of them means just to see. And they, same, they, they, they share the same bilateral root of the resh and the olive. And what I love about that is they share the resh and the olive, awe or fear, and seeing, share the Rish and the Aleph, and what's left of them, the Yud and the He, Hashem. So in talking about pain points, how do we convert our fear into awe through seeing Hashem? And this is a bit of a theme that comes through and trying to understand it through Vayera. So we famously have the three men standing near him, and as soon as he saw them, he ran from the entrance of the tent to greet them, and he bowed to the ground. And he goes and he serves them, right? He goes and he serves them, and he said, My lords, if it please you, do not go on past your servants. And um, then he says, uh, um, So let a little water be brought, bathe your feet, and recline under the tree. And this is when the famous, the famous commentators talk about um, the way he welcomed his guest the way he he washed their feet and the way that he had them recline under the tree. And this is the next point of finding our pain points. And finding our pain points, so often we have a choice. It's a life choice. We could say, oh, this happened to me. It's terrible. I feel awful. I have a cold. I'm so tired. I work too many hours. I hate carpool. Life's terrible. What are we doing in this country? Why am I back in Israel? Like we have all of this fetching that we do, right? But we have a choice. We have a choice. We have a choice. We can choose to live our lives kind of experiencing the fear and the negativity of what surrounds us, or we can apply our ability to see and convert what we're experiencing into something that's curious or awesome. Awesome. Not like awesome, but like awesome. And I think there's something about Avraham and his pain post Brittany law, seeing a guest and then the experience of the other because these are strangers. He doesn't know that these are ministering angels. He doesn't know, you know, I think Rashi says it's Uriel and Gabriel and Michael. He doesn't know that. Raphael, maybe that would make more sense. But he doesn't know who they are. He just knows they're coming to him. And he, he in seeing another human energy before him, he rises to serve another, right? He transcends his pain point in the presence of the opportunity to love and serve. And... I mean, if that's not a hint of what we're at, you know, when we look back at Brit Mila, if that's not a hint, I'm not saying we should hurt little boys. I'm just saying, like, there's something about saying, hey, you're going to experience pain in life. And guess what? You still have an imperative to transcend it and offer love. You still have an opportunity to transcend it and offer love. And maybe if people could, like, before, you know, my husband had hip surgery this summer, and when we were being checked out, they're like, oh, we're going to give you, like, literally, no joke. They're like, we're the only ones who administer it, so we're going to give you, like, 60 pain pills just in case you feel pain. Like, that's 20 days' worth of opiates. And he's like, they said, you can't get it at a pharmacy. You can only get it in a hospital, so you should take it in case you have pain. Well, 20 days of pain pills four times a day is enough to create an addiction, Right. And so you have a choice in that time where you could say, okay, I'm going to be like 
high in the sky for the next, I mean, some people really need it because they have terrible surgeries, but I'm saying, I'm talking about the people who have a choice to say, okay, I'm going to say no, because I think what they're doing is actually bringing me in the wrong direction. Or they can say, okay, yeah, give that to me. And we're going to start a nice, a nice relationship with some pills for 20 days. I'm not saying people who are post-op should not have different um, mechanisms in order to manage pain. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying pain is a choice and our relationship to interact with it is our choice. And sometimes, this is a reminder, the gift, the gift of Bukor Cholim, the gift of Chak Nasar Rahim, like it goes both ways. Here's a mutual relationship. The the angels that were coming to Avraham, I mean, maybe it was Bukor Cholim, maybe they were visiting someone who had just done, done something incredible. But they're coming. So it reminds us about Bukor Cholim to visit the sick. We visit the sick so that they can rise to their guests. That's a pain point. That's transcending the pain point with the loving presence of something godly and something before us. So that's my, my Vayera offering. And I'm going to kind of pivot right now because I want us to do one other. I have a very personal story that I told. And what I did this week is I, um, I was asked to rewrite Eshet Chayel. Eshet Chayel is from Proverbs. It's from Mishle. It's a woman of valor. And I was asked to rewrite it. And in rewriting it, I was rewriting it under the time that I was studying pain points. And no, by the way, if you're interested in hearing more about pain points, I've got a whole lot more that we're talking about tomorrow night at Open Temple. We live stream opentemple.org. You can also find us um, on our YouTube channel and also perhaps on Facebook, but just take a look at opentemple.org and we're going to really be going deeply into Vayera and pain points tomorrow night. And I wanted to then lastly uh, take it to a personal because this is where I think we can go with it. When we do this kind of learning, we can like, journal, we can write a poem, we could take the visitation that Avraham had and make it a story about us, right? And when we were visited from someone and that helped us in, include and transcend what we were experiencing. And it, as I was studying this, I was asked to write about Aisha Chayil and I realized, I don't know if you ever noticed, but I wear this really great ring on my finger. And this is um, a ring by an artist in Israel and it has all of the words of Aisha Chayil on it. And you'll see in a moment why I wear it on my finger all the time. So this is my rewriting of Ishan Chayel, uh, inspired by my experience of pain points in my life. When I met Ishan Chayel in Jerusalem, who will find a woman of valor? That's Mishle, as you know. Who will find a woman of valor? I was asked as I stood around the Shabbos table in the old city. Far from rubies is her value. Far from home was I, an orphan for Shabbos dinner. I was set up with a vegetarian meal at the Kotel by Jeff Seidel. Her husband's tr heart trusts in her. The host asked me where my husband was. Where's your wife? I retorted. He lacks no gain. The host was not impressed with when my ego spun out of con its comfort zone. She is abundantly good to him and not evil. He berated me when I said I wanted to be an actress and I stood silent. All the days of her life, reflecting on the woman I wanted to become, yet feeling lost, reflecting upon my confusing 22 years, standing around a Shabbos dinner in Yerushalayim. She seeks out wool and flash and works willingly with her hands. I knew not of weaving or threshing and wrung my hands beneath the table as I took my seat. She is like a merchant ship. I had just arrived in Israel for the first time the day before in Haifa by boat. She brings her food from afar. She rises while it is still night. She gives food to her household and sets out the tasks for her maids. I just left my job as a nanny to travel around the world and ended up in Israel instead of India as I needed to know who I was before I could become someone else. She considers a field and buys it. From her earnings, she plants a vineyard. I saw the fields of Birkenau on a cold winter's day alone in the Polish suburb. From my savings, I left to see the world. Instead, I found myself in those ashes. She girds her loins with strength and flexes her arms. I ran my first marathon at 19 and had many lovers, and yet I learned quickly that there was emptiness in their beds. She realizes her enterprise is profitable. Her lamp does not go out at night. His apartment was too bright. A fluorescent Shabbat table in the old city. She puts her hands on her spindle and her palms, Grasp the distaff. He weaves his tail 
through introductions, stranger to stranger, the dinner conversation reaches a crescendo when his eyes pierce mine. What do you do for a living? He asks me again. I'm still an actress, I respond. The guests laugh. All ego, he replies. She holds out her hand to the poor and extends her hands to the destitute. In a train station in Budapest, I share my bread and cheese with a woman asking for money. We sit and eat as I wait for my train and communicate through a knife that we share, cutting cheese and bread and cucumbers for one another. She does not fear for her household in the frost, for her entire household is warmed in scarlet. Not ego, I protest, but theater. It's a space for discovering the moment, the holiness of a moment. No, he replies, that is Shabbos. I blush. She makes her own tapestries. Her garments of, are of fine linen and purple. I gather the scarf my friends in Granada gifted me tightly around my shoulders, which are short sleeves in December. Her husband is well known at the gates. At this point, he's turned his attention to a young couple studying together in Jerusalem for the year. As he sits with the elders of the land, Henriette, my 86-year-old neighbor at the Broadmoor, will love this story I daydream. She taught me about the Holocaust as we watched Jeopardy together and ate rum raisin ice cream, talking about sex and fashion. She makes linens and sells them. She provides the merchants with girdles. The guy across from me is staring at me and I feel tingly. The host notices and I move my eyes back to my plate. The food is dry. Strength and dignity are her garb. She looks smilingly towards the future. The host leers at me and continues. So how's the actress enjoying her meal? I have not eaten. I am his example. This was an act of entrapment, I realize, and I'm his folly. She opens her mouth with wisdom and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue as the host and his friends clear our dinner plates and replace them with dessert. The host asks the guests, what is righteous about this woman we're reading about? I look at the text before me numbly and rise at the table like a Tesla cord piercing the night, a rush upward like a geyser or phallus of life force surging inside of me. She watches the conduct of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. A sumptuous wedge of chocolate raspberry cake clanks down before me, on the table, upon the text, glistening before me like bait. I grab the text from beneath the plate, finding my voice. Her children rise and acclaim her, her husband and, his, and, his, and he praises her. There is nothing righteous about this woman, my voice rises. Many daughters have done worthily, but you surpass them all. And I know that you're trying to lure me into this curiosity, but I want you to know that I am curious, but not because of you, but to spite you. Is that a teardrop I detect running down my cheek? Charm is deceptive and beauty is not. Tears are flowing freely now. I choke on my post-nasal drip as my traveler's cold is turned into a nasal infection. A God-fearing woman is one to be praised. The host roars and I rush out of his apartment, down the journey stone steps into the labyrinth of the night, giving her praise for her accomplishments. I am walking briskly, the cold air steaming against my skin. Small window boxes affixed on the Jerusalem stone of entranceways burn oil lamps. It is the first night of Hanukkah. And let her deeds laud her at the gates. Today, I am a rabbi. I've got a few seconds left. I offered this poem tonight as an insight into my pain point. I grew up with no Jewish identity at all, and I had to go on a real journey to win it back. And I'm still on that journey. I'm still in that fight. And every day I'm crushing my teeth on Torah and Talmud. And it is so worth every moment because what we reclaim like Avraham Avinu, when we take hold of the self-determined destiny that is Jewish peoplehood, what we reclaim is the right to an authenticity of self to a continuity of soul and to a connection with an ancestry that knows the force of Ha Bore. Find your soul, go on your soul journey. Blessings for a beautiful week. Next week we'll be back 
with Chaya Sara. We'll talk about what happened at the end of Vayera, and we'll move forward on this incredible Genesis journey. Many blessings to you. Blessings. Be well and Shabbat Shalom.